Okay. Um, hey everyone, and this is kind of a nice time to talk about historic homes in Dighton. Um, first, I'd like to introduce the other members of the Historical Commission that are here tonight. The, um, I'm the chairperson. Rafa Delphin up here in front is the vice chair and the acting clerk. Um, and Pat Olson is here. She's a member. Irene Alley is here, and she is a member too. Um, we also, Ron Smith is not here. He's our other member. But in case you're interested, we have two vacancies. And all you have to do if you're interested in history and want to work with us, you have to fill out a volunteer form from Town Hall. We'd love to have you. So um, we're here to talk about Dighton's historic homes and the survey that we did in 2022. Historic survey. This project reviewed the existing inventory that is on the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System, also known as MACRIS. And this is a database of all of the properties that have been identified as historical in Massachusetts. Some of the properties in Dighton that are listed on there were done in the early 70s and 80s by members of that historical commission. This was a huge, huge um, volunteer project that they did. They actually filled out the forms. They ran, went around and took the pictures of the buildings. They did the research. And some of the forms are a little scanty because at that time, the historical Massachusetts Historical Commission was not requiring a whole lot of information. Granted now, their um, details have changed. They ask for much more reference and they also ask for references uh, and documentation of sources. So who did the survey? Well, through funding from our Community Preservation um, Committee and a grant from the Massachusetts Historical uh, Commission with some funding from the National Park Service, the Dighton Historical Commission in the town of Dighton was able to hire a preservation consultant um, and her name was Stacy Spies. And this project could not have been completed without the support of the Board of Selectmen and the voters at town meeting, plus CPC, because they were the money source. So we thank all of them who have supported our projects to preserve Dighton's history. So where were these surveys done? What houses were done? So we began by identifying the oldest houses in Dighton that we could. We looked at tax bases. We looked at the past um, inventory that was on the MACRS website, kind of blended them together, made up a huge list of properties, whittled it down and whittled it down until we got finally 93 properties that have been, um, have either an updated survey or a new survey. Uh, they were mainly along Elm Street, Center Street, Pleasant Street, and Main Street at this point in time, because that's where a lot of the historic homes are, because that's near the river where the industry was. So why would we want to do this? Well, slowly, as you all know, our historical landscape here in Dighton is changing, and it's important to document our history. In preservation, the first step is to identify what your historical resources are. And that's what this survey is doing. It's helping us to identify and to document these um, homes, buildings. Next comes to evaluate for um, significance. And this is done at the local and the state and even the national le levels. And that's where your National Register of Historic Places comes in. <laughs> And we also wanna make sure that Dighton's story remains, that the history of this town doesn't get lost. In talking about some of these historic homes in Dighton, we have to remember that these are private homes and they're not open to the public. And they are fortunate, we're fortunate to share that history. Um, so remember, if you're out looking at historical homes, just view from the street, um, don't kind of like, Say, hey, hi, I'm here. <laughs> so the information I'm sharing tonight is also just a um, highlight of each building. I know that each of these buildings could have an hour on their own to tell their story in Hit Titans history. Um, so it's just a little snapshot, just a little highlight. And on 
this picture here is 171 Center Street, and this is the Dwight and Macy Lane House. Um, it was built around that 1914. It's an ex excellent example of craftsman and colonial revival styles here in Dighton. Dwight Lane uh, served as Dighton's treasurer and clerk for 55 years. He was quite a player in the business world in Dighton here. And his wife, Macy, also served as the postmistress and the post office was in this house, in one of the rooms in this house. Dwight and Macy were the parents of Helen Holmes Lane, our first town historian and the author of the history of Dighton. And Helen Lane also made this her home. I think Helen Lane is just like so fantastic. You know, she's just like an idol to have. <laughs> so what is an inventory be for? Well, this is the um, form that the Mass Historical Commission uses for identifying and documenting historic buildings. It gives you general information such as the location, maps, uses, date of construction, condition, architect. Um, it also has the architectural description of the building. And some of those are quite detailed as far as the kinds of house um, style it is, the bays, the windows, the doors. I learned more terms than I ever thought I would about building design. Um, it gives a historical narrative that is, you know, tells you some of the history, but granted there is always more to tell. The most important part, I think, is that it gives you a, um, your references and your bibliography. It gives you pictures as it exists today and historic pictures if they are available. And you have to be able to see in these um, descriptions and in the pictures, the characteristics that are representative of buildings that are 50 to 100 years old or more. Now, people in the 1700s and the 1800s also remodeled their homes like we do. They added porches, they added L's, they added rooms on. So a lot of the homes that you see actually have, may have started much smaller and have gradually grown. I know like my mom's house that I grew up in, the back part of it was earlier than the front part of her house. And you could tell that through some of the construction of the house. And this is often very true of all of these older homes. And it gives you information that helps to identify the historical significance of the building. Now, there are other forms that exist for monuments that you may have in town, cemeteries, um, areas, so that, um, and we have three areas that were identified in this past, no, four areas. We have the um, Elm Street area, the lower four corners, South um, the Dighton Village, South Dighton Village, which is along Pleasant Street and Main Street, the brick area, um, which is off of Center Street and Middle Street, and 100 Acres was another area formed um, that was identified. This is what, it's kind of hard to see, but this is what the form looks like. You can see it has the picture of Old Town Hall. It's an Old Town Hall constructed in 1869. And this information came from meeting records. Andrew Waldron and Asa Dean and Son were the architect slash builders. And Andrew Waldron was an architect and builder on a lot of the homes here in Dighton. So when you see his name come up, you know that he, he was quite the businessman. And I also hear tell that he was a had business connections with Dwight Lane. Um, it gives a little locus map as to where it is. You can see there's the architectural description, the historical narrative. Now in the narrative for this building, it was built, uh, construction began in 1869 in April, it had a budget of $3,500 to build. And it was actually a little bit further that way um, it was moved when the high school was built and the middle school that was there, um, which burned. It was moved when that building was, was um, built. So it came over this way a little bit. But anyway, in, this, in September of 1869, they had a great September gale and it knocked down the framing and blew much of it away. And they had to start again. I never knew that about this hall. <laughs> um, 
Here you can see the different pictures. It shows you the picture of as it is now, a picture from the 1912 bicentennial. And then when it was in 1970s, it was also known as the Dighton Rock Range. So it tells you how this building has served Dighton throughout the years. Now, where do you find this information? Well, the forms are available by contacting the Historical Commission. And I brought a notebook full of all the forms from the survey that we just completed. It's over on that table. They're gonna be at Town Hall um, in the Assessor's Office. They'll have that the information available there. It's gonna be available at the Dighton Public Library, um, giving Jocelyn a flash drive with all of the PDFs on it. So it's there. The forms will also be available at the Dighton Historical Society. And they're available on the MACRIS website. So I thought I'd show you the MACRIS website. Oops, go back. Now it's going forward. Wait a minute. I hate. Click too fast and away you go. So this takes you, this is the um, MACRIS website. It's um, under the Massachusetts, um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts website. You can go and do Dighton. And it lists all of the areas first. It has all of the, old forms and they're slowly getting the newer forms that were done on onto the website as they digitize everything as Mount, all the Mount Hope finishing companies. Let's go to onto the, the DIG and the identification number, when you click on that, it actually downloads to your computer. So you have it right on your computer. You don't can't read it on the um, their website. So that's that. And if you just Google MACRIS, M-A-C-R-I-S, it'll come up. Of course, now it's gonna make me go through this whole thing again. Okay. The other place you can find it is on the assessor's page, the Town of Dighton's assessor's page. And on the left-hand column, it says um, GIS maps. And this is the link to that. This is uh, what the map looks like. It's very hard to read. We also have a copy over there to look at. Even enlarged, it still is hard to read. I have a larger one that will be at the assessor's office. So you click on that. And that's the map of Dighton. You go over to layers, it has different layers, the historic map. It has, the dots are, now I have to move this. all the homes that have been identified. You can click on one of them and the information about that property shows up, tells you the address, tells you the owner, all of the information that you need to know about that property. But that's kind of cool too. So there's a number of ways you can access the information. Of course. So we have two National Register of Historic Districts. Here in Dighton. One's on Water Street, the Quorum Shipyard, and the other one is the Wharfs District along on Pleasant Street. This is the shipyard, the Quorum Shipyard, and this is the Wharfs District. This house is the John Hathaway House at 2120 Water Street. 
um, and this house right now was for sale. Um, and it was just sitting there. So it was so sad, so sad. Anyway, it was possibly built circa 1700, um, possibly earlier. John Hathaway was a partner with Thomas Coram at the shipyard. Later, Jeremiah Jones lived here and operated a store. Major Charles Whitmarsh also re, um, resided here and ran a store. And Charles Whitmarsh was a, um, a businessman in Dighton. He had not only the store, he was involved with shipbuilding and a few other things here in town. Later owners included William Wood and Dwight Lane. Here, if you look at the Thomas Coram house um, on the right, this house is around 1699. And that's why it may be the Hathaway house is actually from 1699 circa there because um, Thomas Coram and John Hathaway were partners at the shipyard. Um, Thomas Coram, of course, we all know he was the philanthropist from um, England. Actually, he went back to England. He moved to Dighton in 1693, and that's when Dighton was still part of Taunton, the South Purchase. So these, this shipyard was here before Dighton was incorporated. And then later, George, um, George Shogue lived here in the 1800s, and he added the porch and the fence around um, 1880. The shipyard wharf is actually where the Taunton Yacht Club is, and it's an old stone wharf. But it's, um, that's probably around 1698. Um, it's also referred to sometimes as the Whitmarsh Wharf. And I was always like, what do you mean Whit Whitmarsh Wharf? Where's, you know, but there, it's the same place. Um, shipyard building, shipbuilding was very important in Dighton. The, the maritime industry was a huge, huge industry here. Um, the Coram Shipyard closed about 1703. And, but the area still remained important for a lot of maritime related businesses. The Wharfs National Register District includes the Customs House, the Andrew Spooner House, uh, the Eddy House, Darius Perry House, and the three wharfs along on Pleasant Street. Um, and this is kind of a special area for me because I grew up on Pleasant Street. So, uh, This is the customs house. It now has a porch, a farmer's porch on the front of it. It's at 2298 Pleasant Street. And this was the local customs collector's house. Dighton was the customs port until 1834, and then it moved to Fall River, or as it was known then, Troy. Um, Elkanah Andrews built this house for his son, Thomas. It was built uh, before 1787. And a room in this house served as a customs office. Padijah Bailey's uh, was our first customs tax collector. And he actually ran his office out of the Hadijah Bailey's house, the parsonage for the community church up on Elm Street. So you're gonna see Elkanah Andrews was huge in this town because he also built the, the Elkanah Andrews James Spooner House at 2308 Pleasant Street. It was built around 1770 and enlarged about 1870. Elkanah Andrews was a sea captain and he participated in the trade with the West Indies in South America. He served on many committees here in Dighton in his time period. And he may have been at his time, the richest man in Dighton. Um, in 1803, the house sold to the James Spooner family, and they were a wealthy family from Rhode Island. And they, the Spooner family actually owned the house until the 1970s. This is a picture of the Eddy House at 2320 Pleasant Street. It too was built um, by Elkanah Andrews uh, before 1787. And he built it for his son, Elkanah Jr. Later, Darius Perry um, bought this house for his daughter, Mary Perry, who married William Eddy of Somerset. William P. Eddy, their son, married Leela Cobb, who lived in my mom's house. Um, they opened up the Eddy house. Now, the Eddy house was the place to go. It was a resort, a summer resort. It was like 
people flocked here. They would come for the summer and summer in Dighton along the river from Fall River, Providence. They had fine dining. Um, they would be up on the wharf. You know, there was a gazebo there, boating. It was a wonderful place to be in Dighton. <laughs> This is the Darius Perry house, 2328 Pleasant Street. I saw two dates on this. One says 1790, around 1790. One says around 1750. It's probably, could be either one of those, depending on how they added on. Um, again, Darius Perry was a sea captain and a merchant. He also served as a representative to the general court in 1825. He served as a selectman in town in 1819, and he was a colonel in the Dighton militia. This is a picture of the three wharfs. The one closest to us, where the sign is, that's called the Andrews Wharf. The one in the middle is the Spooner Wharf, and the last one is the Perry Wharf. And that wharf right now has a fortress look to it. You know, someone builds all that ugly stuff on it. It's in a National Historic District. The owner can do that, which is kind of sad, but that's what, there's no limits, no stopping the owners when you're in the National Historic Districts. Um, so those are our, our two historic districts. So there is a difference between um, a historic district and a local historic district. If you're in the National Register District, it recognizes the importance of the history to the community, the state, or the nation. It allows owners of income producing property some tax incentives, but it provides limited protection from adverse effects by federal or state projects. And it provides, does not limit the owner's handling of the property at all. You can add to it, you can demolish it, you can paint it purple. It doesn't, the national, that's only honorary. But there are over 900 national registered districts here in Massachusetts. A local historic district is more effective at preventing historic losses. The steps for the districts are outlined in the Mass Chum General Laws Chapter 40C. And it's a local bylaw that's established by town meeting with a two thirds majority. So that means it would have to go to one of our annual or um, special town meetings. There's no review of the interior. If you're in the national register um, district, you can be a house by yourself. If you're a house by yourself, they wanna know about the interior. They ask for pictures of the interior. If it's an area form, they just do the exteriors of the homes. A local of the inter interiors. There are over 200 local historic districts in Massachusetts. So now we have our historical marker program that the commission started. We established this in 2019. The Winslow Davis House was our first marker. Um, <clears throat> We did this to educate the community and the tourists about Dighton's history. It honors our historic resources in Dighton. And there are seven homes in Dighton that have historical markers um, on their homes already. So tonight, I thought we would have people come and talk about their houses. So the first one is at 400 um, Lincoln Avenue, this is Eugene Rose House. And Rafa is the co-owner with, with Dan. And Raf is going to tell us a little bit about his house. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Dighton Public Library for hosting this event and coordinating with the Historical uh, Commission. And I think we need more events like this, especially if we want to educate the public, the residents, especially of Dighton, about local history, because a lot of them, especially people who have moved from, from other towns to Dighton, know very little or know nothing at all, or are not interested whatsoever. 
let me explain, let me tell you about, a little bit of uh, history about this house. Um, Dan, my partner and I used to live in Milton for 16 years, I believe. And when I saw, when I saw this, well, we decided, you know, Milton was getting too crowded for us. Uh, we had a, a house in the corner of a very uh, two busy streets where Starbucks is across the street and a parking lot next door. And I was sick and tired of people tramping on my lawn and littering. Uh, I told them, listen, we need to move to the country. We need some fresh air. We need, we need some new vibe. We, we need new friends, et cetera. So one day I was, uh, I was looking at the, I believe it was Zillow.com for, for available houses in this area or anywhere outside Milton. And we considered several towns like um, we have both Easton. We saw this beautiful house in Easton and I wanted to move there immediately. But I said, mm, I don't know about this. <laughs> it, was, it was just too dark, you know, and, and very smelly. And then I went to Dighton. Oh, my God. And I saw this beautiful. At that time, I thought it was a Victorian house. Honey, this is the house that I want to move in, live in and die in, inside this house. OK. <laughs> And and we immediately called the uh, real estate broker. His name is Matt, and he was nice enough to give us a tour of the house. At that time, the house had already been um, refurbished inside and out by the the guy who sold this to us. Eric, is it Eric? Real yeah. estate, yeah. yeah. Eric Lewis. Eric Lewis. So Eric met with us, and he gave us a tour of of, of the house in the area, and. I said, listen, I want this house. So we were able to negotiate, you know, for a good price and whatnot. And then that was December 20, December 16th was when we closed the deal, I believe. And December 22nd, when we physically moved in. So it was three days before Christmas. So imagine the house was empty, no furniture, except for the two of us and our dog at that time, uh, Dusty was a Shih Tzu. And, um, and then it started to rain and then it started to get cold and everything. But you know what? I didn't care. You know, I was already in this ideal perfect house. Okay. So as soon as we got settled, I started to do more research about the house. And I discovered, wow, this house was at that time, I thought this house was built in 1850, but it was actually built in 1880 by a man named Eugene Rose, who happened to be an architect, right? I think it was an architect. Metal, metal worker. He was a metal worker, yeah. But he actually designed this house, I believe. Or was it Waldrow? It was Waldrow, yeah. It was Waldrow. So, and then the more I did research about this house, you know, I posted on Facebook pages, you know, does anybody know about the history of this house? And people started sending me all this information. And some person who used to live there, uh, Ralph Simmons, had a son, I believe, who is a doctor and who lives somewhere in. Pacific Northwest, he found out about my inquiry and he sent me, started sending me pictures of the old house from way back. And even an illustration of the house, uh, you know, with a spire on top of the tower. Right now, I don't know what happened to the spire, but I want one. Okay, so <laughs> anybody out there know of a resource where I can get a beautiful 19th century spire to put on the tower, I'll be happy. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so we moved in and then uh, I think it was like four months later, the spring of 2017, Dighton had a little fair, um, flea market of some sort here. And that's when I started socializing, introducing myself. And then I, that's when I met Myrna Santos. I didn't know who she was at that time, but she introduced herself, you know, I'm the town historian, blah, blah, blah. And so one thing led to another, she introduced me to other people who are also involved in history. And I said, you know what? This is exactly what I needed. Okay, this town is so, so lovely. Everybody's so charming, everybody's wonderful. And that really convinced me, you know, to, to stay. Um, so we did some renovations and whatnot, but I, I realized just touring around the town, I didn't see a lot of like historical markers because I know in neighboring towns like, uh, I don't know, uh, Sandwich, Concord, uh, you know, all the little towns that are historically rich, they have all these little markers. How come Dine doesn't have one? So I, I decided to, you know, do some research and I consulted with the historical commission. What do you think of the possibility of having a historical marker program in Dighton? Because I think we need one. There's so many houses 
that are so you know old but deserve recognition and and that's how to start a uh, we started the program back in 2019. So, so far, we have seven Dighton houses that have historical markers. Two uh, residents have applied. And I think it's a very strong they're mm -hmm. going to get it anyway. Mm -hmm. you know? So, and that's it. It just uh, it just like snowballed. You know, people found out about the program. I want one of those, stuff, this, stuff and everything. Just think of it. If you have a, a historical house that is about, you know, that you want to be proud of, wouldn't it be nice to have a little historical marker that says, I live in this beautiful house. <laughs> this is historic, you know. I mean, who knows about the history of your house? I mean, somebody famous died there, some murder, domestic violence. Who knows, okay? Uh, a crazy artist. And it, that's all part of history. So whatever it is, just put it on your application form and we're more than happy to uh, consider it. So, yeah. So this is history. That's Eugene Rose House. I also found they call it the Dighton Abbey. Where do you live? I live in Dighton Abbey. Wish that. Oh. That's why I'm looking for that little spire thing to put on the tower. So it, looks, it looks like a real abbey. <laughs> so yeah, so that's it. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask. And I'm more than happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. Are you talking about the walkway? Because well, the walkway did not exist back then. Yes. Yeah. But parts of the outside, did you um, intentionally keep it historic and the colors that? It was actually, it was Eric Lewis, the guy who sold us the house. He did all the renovations outside and also most, mostly inside. I mean, we did some little renovations here and there, but he tried to remain loyal to the original architecture. And you see the dormer, the dormer windows. That's um, that's very characteristic of um, Second Empire architecture. And I think this house is the only Second Empire style of house in Dighton. Because I'd be like driving around, I couldn't see any similar house. So it's not a Victorian house, which I thought it was, but it's a Second Empire. And yeah. the colors that you chose are they historically significant or not necessarily? Ah, uh, I don't think so. No. Okay. Other than like brightly painted Victorians for this style, um, dark gray, black, white, and dark green. Very. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he, put, he pretty much remained loyal to the uh, um, architecture, general uh, type of architecture. Great. Who's next? All right. Thank you, Rap. <laughs> This is Chris Pacheco. Um, she's going to talk about the Winslow Davis House, which is the Historical Society House, and Chris is the president of our His Dighton Historical Society. Come on up, Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm actually going to talk about the uh, Winslow Davis House, and then I'll talk about my house after yeah, that. Can I tell you, too? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> uh, the Winslow Davis house was built by Job Winslow. Uh, 1770 is the date on the beam in the attic. And when we had the Providence uh, Preservation Society yeah. come in, when the society bought the house in 1968, we had them come in to look at it. And some of the ceilings were taken apart at the time, and they think the lathes put there before the revolution. So that 1770 date holds true for the house. It's considered a three-quarter colonial. The reason for that are there are two sets of windows on one side of the house, of the door, the door, and then one set of windows on the other side. I don't have much more information than that, but that's considered a three-quarter colonial. Just as a side note, the house had some updates in 2017, and we had a gentleman called Jeff Gagne from Boston Preservation come down, and the color on the house is an authentic color. There were no white farmhouses in the 1770s. So that color is an authentic color for what the house would have been. Let me get to my next one. Oh, wait on your house. Huh? Wait on your house. No, I'm not okay. doing my house. Okay. I'm still doing Winslow Davis. Oh, okay. Go, girl. Go. <laughs> the house is called uh, the Winslow Davis house for two reasons. Obviously, Joe Winslow built it. Sam Davis was a selectman in town. He owned the house in the 1850s, 1860s, and he served multiple terms as selectman in town. 
This house's provenance is actually Joe Winslow and his son. Both fought in the Revolutionary War. Both fought with the Rehoboth Minutemen under Timothy Walker because Dighton and Rehoboth mustered together. One of them, was father, fought on land. We believe he may have been at Valley Forge. We're thinking it's the father because the second job is tough. The son was on the Brigantine Freedom. It was uh, captained by a man from Dighton called John Cousin. They actually became privateers and they pirated the British ships to get the goods and things we needed to keep ourselves going in the war. So this house, because of the history of the owner and the part they played in the revolution, has a provenance that's well beyond the fact that it was built in 1770. Uh, I got one more thing I want to tell you. I had them all numbered, so they'd go in some kind of order. The house on the inside is the front part of the house has a uh, floor to ceiling columns. Those are the supports. They're in the corners. They are normally, my house is the same. They are planed and they are planed with a bead just to add a little bit of niceness to the fact that things are pretty rough. Somewhere in the 80s, the last part of the house gets add on. That's our kitchen right now. Um, that's the part that settled the most. It's pretty, when you look at the doorways, it looks like somebody was drunk for a long time when they were building this house, but it's just the fact that that's the way it was. Um, you can't do much about that. But all in all, it's built well. It survived a lot of years. It's still got a lot more years in it. And um, there is stenciling in that house. We still have some original stenciling. Preservation from Providence also confirmed the time frame somewhere again in maybe the 1820s or the 1830s. This is a farmhouse. People were not wealthy. And um, so there's no fancy wallpaper ever in there in the beginning. There's nothing that you would look at and say, wow, no fancy rugs. Um, animals stayed in the bottom. Children slept upstairs when uh, in the summer when there was no storage up there. In the winter, all the grain. Everything they needed to store with their food was on the second floor. Everybody slept on the first floor. But there's stenciling in there. And that's probably an itinerant stencil. What would happen is someone didn't have a home. Someone didn't, they were an artist. So they would travel town to town and paint for you stencils in return for room and board. So the stenciling and there's still a little bit that's original is there for you to see it. And then... Some of the ladies in the 1960s, early 1970s, when the house was bought by the society, decided to duplicate it. They had it drawn out. They repainted the whole thing so that it looks just like the stenciling that was done in that room at the time. That's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. So next are two homes on Main Street that are owned by the Olson family. And Pat's going to come on up and talk about those. There are no spires on either house. <laughs> okay. The first house I'd like to talk about is at 925 Main Street. It's a typical Victorian home. It has a white wraparound porch. If you're going up Main Street, slowly because the road will beat yeah. your car up like you <laughs> if you're going up main street it's on the left hand side before you hit the big hill toward william street so that's where it's located that home um it's a typical victorian inside i have rosettes on the woodwork i have all glass doorknobs inside it's a nine room house five bedrooms in addition to um, the bedrooms and the rec the other rooms it has two halls I have a front staircase with a beautiful baluster that with beautiful stairs. And then I have a back stairway that looks like horses could climb up it. It's the most basic rundown crappy. So evidently that was like a servant's entrance, but I have two working stairways to go upstairs. And we always use the crappy one. We don't use the real nice <laughs> one. And there's two bathrooms and there's two halls. So when I bought the house in the eighties, um, I had, nine rooms plus two halls and two bathrooms that needed paint, wallpaper, flooring, you name it. So it's really a do-it-yourself kind of thing. This home was built in 1891. 
It was built by a brick mason named Hiram Bowen. So it's the Hiram Bowen house. Um, he was very wealthy. He built a nine room house. He had one daughter, him and the wife had one daughter. He's buried in the Unitarian Community Church Cemetery. And it's a beautiful, huge stone. And it says Bowen Hathaway, that's the son-in-law's name. So the one daughter, Mabel, married a Hathaway from Taunton. And so if you're in that cemetery, it's huge. You can tell he's got money and he showed off. I mean, <laughs> that house was not built where it is now. It was moved years ago in the 60s. A lot of homes in Dighton were moved around. And this was one of them. And I have the clippings from the Totten Gazette of them taking pictures of the house being put onto a trailer and slowly moved up the street. I was a kid. I was living up the street. And I was on my bicycle and we were going to drive down there to see this thing. And my mother said, you stay away from there. They have enough problems backing a house into the road. So we were not allowed to go down. And who in their crazy wildest imagination, I bought it 20 something years later. But it was built where the Carnegie Library is. You know, there's a parking lot to the left of the library. That's where my house was. I bought the house from a family named Benavides. And for any longtime Dyken people, Rita, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Bill Benavides was selectman in town for many, many years. And the family ran a grocery store at the bottom of Main Street, right across from the infamous Red and White. Um, ICI was expanding at the time and they wanted to knock down this house, which was next to the library. So it was going to be raised and they did raise the, the location of the store. So although I live in the Benavides house, if you ever hear anybody say, oh, they moved that up the street, not the store. The store was not moved. The store was knocked down. So just because I have some really great stuff that was in the Benavides store doesn't mean it's the original store because it's not. So it was slowly moved up, backed into place, and it is what it is. And I love that house. And I'll be moving there when I'm dead also. <laughs> the other house I want to talk about is at 1136 Main Street, and that's where I grew up. So go down Main Street again, go slow, go up the hill, and the house with the big red barn and the tulips in the back. Okay, so that's where I grew up. Didn't look like that when I was young, but we won't go there. So there is no significance inside of the house at 1136. It was built by a Portuguese family. Um, that house was built in 1901. But there is no historical significance to that home. What's historically significant? It's the last farmhouse on Main Street. It's the last farm that's there. When I was a kid, there was there were dairies, there were um, chicken farms, there were vegetable farms on Main Street. You don't see them no more. That's the only one that's still running. So in 1901, a, a man named Joe Perry Sue bought the land from a a gentleman from Plymouth. And then he, he and family built that house. Nothing special, three small bedrooms, nothing inside that would warrant, would never put a spire on there, never. It's just plain, it's just a plain house. However, the 27 acres of land that Joe Perry suit bought remained with the house. Um, he farmed it, he had, in one of the old town books, it talked about him having a horse and two cows. And that's what they ran. They made their livelihood from a horse, two cows, and some dirt. I mean, that was, they were poor farmers. That's what they were. Joe Perry Sue sold the house in 1951 to some newlyweds. Um, my mother and father were married in January of 51, and they bought that house in April of the same year. So in the last hundred years, there's only two families that have lived there. So my father bought it. My father did not farm as a full-time occupation. He made us, <laughs> he made us, <laughs> that was a hobby for him <laughs> and for us evidently. So my father was a machinist. So it's not like he was home all the time. He would go to work and my mother never had a driver's license. So she was sort of stuck there. There wasn't much on um, Main Street at the time. Um, there was a party line for a telephone. You couldn't get your own private phone. Um, there was an outhouse when they bought the house. My mother said, there will be a toilet inside the house. 
there was an outhouse when they got there. So anyway, for so since 51, my family has been there. Uh, my father used to raise butternut squash and they used to have pick your own Italian tomatoes. And we used to get people from the Boston area. They would come and pick themselves like 30 bushel, 40 bushel of tomatoes. God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. Um, so my dad passed away in 89 and my mom and my brother continued farming. And my mom passed away in 2015. My brother passed away in 2016. So my son has been there since. And you'll notice the barn. Well, if you remember the barn, what it used to look like, what he's done to that place. To He built stone walls that look like they've been there forever. And I, he just, it looks beautiful. My mother would love to see the things he's done. My father would roll over because of the money he's spending <laughs> to do those things. But those are the two homes that we have on Main Street. So thank you. Thank you. Our next house is the William Walker House on 624 Middle Street. And Joanne Racine, the owner, is going to talk about her home. Okay. Um, I don't have too much history. This is my house now. Um, but it didn't look like that when we bought it in 1980. It actually um, had asbestos siding, and then there was like a front porch that was added on. But anyway, I'll go back to just a little bit of the history. Uh, I know it dates back to circa 1770. I was able to trace it back. Years ago when I bought it, I went to the Registry of Deeds, and I was doing pretty well until I got up to about the 1820s. And then I thought I was going on the um, off on the wrong track because it started talking about um, uh, let's see what was the name? Wellington, and I thought, oh God, you know, I'm I'm going in the wrong direction. So I I just left it, and then I had my children, and I never went back until um, Pat asked me if I wanted a historic marker. So I went back to the registry about a year ago. And uh, I was able to trace it back to about 1770. Uh, uh, that's And it was uh, built by a William Walker. And then in the 1800s, it went to a George B. Townsend. Uh, there were a bunch of families, different families, the gays and some other people. And then the Perrys lived in it for about 40 years from the 30s to the 70s. Uh, so... Some of it hasn't really changed too much on the interior because it was owned by poor farmers, so they didn't really update it like some of the other houses where the people were wealthier. It's really a farmhouse. Um, I can give you a little bit of the history from 1980 when I bought it. Like I said, it had asbestos siding on it. Um, it really looked awful. I don't let's see if I can bring it up here. Um, Oh, it's on this side. And so it was a gray asbestos siding. Some of the paint was coming off. But uh, they, it was used as a two family. When we bought it, it had been uh, used for like the last maybe eight to 10 years as a two family. And so, uh, but we saw it as a diamond in the rough because my husband and I loved old houses and we saw that it was a, a center chimney colonial with um, six fireplaces. So uh, because we loved it so much, we did a lot of work to it. Uh, also, when we um, were trying to do some like paint and things like that, we did find some of the original stenciling that itinerants would do as they traveled the countryside. And we also found some faux graining. So they used to um, use combs to make some of the pine doors look like a, a richer type of wood, like maybe cherry or something like that. So we did find traces of some of that, but we didn't strip it all. We, my husband covered it with something. So in the future, if we wanted to uncover it, we could. Um, Let's see. So my house, we were hoping we'd find some of the doorway. There was nothing there. But what we did uncover was the original when we took off the porch, we did find the original large stone. And that was the front step from the 1700s. So we were happy to find that. But um, unfortunately, nothing else. But my husband was, um, he was a purist and he, he liked 
uh, authentic thing. So what he decided to do was he literally made the archway on the door and the door. So what he did was he made a form and he uh, used like a surfactant, like a downy fabric softener. And he actually over time steamed that door, that arch to make, to make the arch. And uh, so there it is. And he also did the pilasters. I remember going to a bank in Newport that was historic. And we actually measured the pilasters that come down so that we could, we could uh, duplicate it. And uh, let's see, and then, like I said, he was um, a purist. So we bought the, when we bought it, it was actually like one over one window. So we bought the frames that are 12 over 12 without glass. And um, my husband had been saving old poured glass from windows that people had thrown out. And he actually cut all those little 12 over, two, uh, well, you know, the small panes and put them in because he wanted the wavy look. He wanted it to be authentic. Um, we did find some of the original clapboards underneath the asbestos siding. So my husband took off those clapboards and stripped them and put, um, I think it was linseed oil on the back to protect it. Um, we it did need a lot of restoration. Part of the front wall was buckling. So my husband took out the bottom quarter of the wall and I can actually show you what it looked like. And he put in new um, vertical sheathing. Oh, here it is. So you can see that that's all new vertical sheathing. We put in all new windows. And um, also the there was a wall, like the fireplace wall in the hollow that was buckling. So he redid that wall. Um, it's kind of a labor of love. It is a labor of love because nobody <laughs> nobody would do it if they didn't love their house. And just to, to end it, I just have a, a poem that I found in a book years ago and I love it. And it's for people who love old houses and it's called Fulfillment. And it says, the man who built this house of mine a hundred years ago with Christian doors of smooth, clear pine and chestnut timbers row on row whose oxen hauled the brick and lime, who squared the heart scrub stone, could not foresee that fate and time would someday make it all my own. Of course he knew that it would stay here on its sturdy sills. Long after his last spring should lay, her fragrant mornings on the hills. So even if he did not know just who its owners were to be, I'll still maintain that years ago, he planned and built this house for me. Oh, nice. so. <laughs> so Joanne was talking about she had trouble at the Registry of Deeds because all of a sudden she ended up in Wellington. For those of you who don't know, um, that part, there was a part of Dighton that kind of seceded um, and was called Wellington. I think it was about for 14 years or so. Uh, 1914, I'm sorry, 1814 to 1826. Yeah. I just looked it up today. There you go. And um, then they came back home to Dighton. You know, so, um, yeah. So when you're doing research on your homes, you got to remember, you know, like it's not everything would be named the same. Um, go beyond, you know, like look beyond, as Joanne found out. Yes. <laughs> So our next house is the Reed Briggs house at 2150 Pleasant Street and Karen Gannon, that homeowner is gonna speak about that. You can tell these people all love their homes. <laughs> Not always. Not always. <laughs> One of the things that's a little bit um, different is that uh, when I went and looked back at some of the deeds, it wasn't 2150 Pleasant Street, it was 13 Pleasant Street, which gets a little confusing when you're trying to do research when they, you know, the deeds don't have even a number, you know, so that you really need to be careful to try and figure out, you know, if, if you're looking at the correct owners. Um, this house, uh, we were able to find that the land was bought in um, 1829 from Charles Whitmarsh, who you've heard previously, um, and it was bought by um, Anthony Reed and his wife, um, Elizabeth Bliss um, Reed, and she's part of the Bliss family um, from Rehoboth. 
um, the first deed that we could come up with was in 1841, and it was actually given to us by the former owners. Um, what we found was that the house was then bought by Charles Walker Briggs um, in 1841, and it stayed in his family for 115 years. So trying to um, go through the deeds to be able to say, okay, this person's inherited one third, this, this person's one eighth and so forth. And then going through was, you know, very tedious. But about the mocker program at least gave me some incentive to continue. And when I really got interested was when I started to like meet the people online that live there um, to take a look for, through like um, family search and those kind of um, websites, you know, to find out, first of all, that they weren't necessarily very rich um, and they had a lot of jobs, you know, that they were, did farming and all of those kind of things. They invested in schooners when they had money. Um, some of them, um, they were called masters of the vessels that they, they were in. That part really was very interesting. When you look at my house, um, the end parts of it do not have the cellar underneath. So those were something that was added on. The cellar is only about half the depth um, of the house. So the house originally was very small. And the Reeds ended up having 11 children. So I imagine that was one of the reasons why they sold it, because I'm not sure that you would, where the bodies went, you know, <laughs> to sleep or, or whatever. Um, and the, there's a stone foundation, but there's also a floor. And so the slabs of stone are huge. They're like three by sometimes four feet, all placed. Um, and, you know, the, every once in a while, there's little places where you can see there's just dirt and there's not stone that's exactly there. But there's only one time we ever had water, you know, in our cellar. And I think it was when everyone in Dighton um, a number of years ago, after like 15 inches of rain, had some water, but it was only an inch or two. So it's very, very um, sandy there, and we just had a perk test, and it looks like all the soil there is all sand. So I'm sure at one point the river had something to do with that. Um, so certainly, um, one of the things you know that we like about this house is that we are really only officially the fourth owner. You know, you have the Reeds, and then you have the entire 115 years of the Briggs family. Um, and then Fred and Dot Robinson, um, they bought it in 1956, and then we bought it in 1980. So one of the things that we like about the house is because people didn't really do a lot to the house, the um, floors, a lot of them are the original wide um, pine floors, and we did have them refinished. And the person had said, you probably only have so many times to refinish these, you know, so, you know, be careful. And a lot of them have, um, you know, certainly the historic, you know, openings between the boards there where they used to be. Some places you can still see some of the, the rope that's there, but you'd have to be able to tell my kids, you'd be careful, you know, what goes down the, that crack because you may never see it again. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we have um, certainly some interior chimneys in the walls that you can tell are certainly that old, but we've had to replace certainly the, the ones that you see outside. Um, we also replaced um, the front siding. Um, we had a problem at one point where the front door would not open or close. And so we, so we had a carpenter come and said that the problem is the sill, it's rotted under the front door. And he said, but if I take it apart and the sills are all rotted, you might as well just sell this house. Um, and what he found was that he broke two saws trying to just cut part of the sill because he said, I don't know where this wood come, came from. He said, but this is original wood. He said, these sills are never going anywhere. 
he said, you just have to make sure that you, you know, protect where, you know, the doors are um, for that. And so we did find someone who loved old houses, um, who had, we, we had a fan that was old that had fallen apart. And he said, I would love it if I could build you one, you know, very similar to, you know, what others had talked about. And so that we were excited to at least have that fan again, um, which was part of the original house. Um, we did a woman who came and said, I used to live in this house. I think her last name was Bright. Um, and um, it was probably relative with, I think the last Briggs person who lived in our house was Alan Briggs Brightman and said there used to be shutters on the house. I think you need to put them back. And, and I thought, well, that wasn't really in the plan. And I've never seen a picture with shutters on the house. So, you know, other than that, you know, a lot of the things, you know, are, you know, still there. Um, it's not fancy woodwork that's there so that you know that they really didn't have a lot of money originally. But I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now Chris is going to come back. Oh, no, we're going to talk about um, our last historical marker recipient. This is um, 2221 Summer Street. You want to talk about this a little wrapper or you want me just to give a okay. um this is a Mount Hope finishing company house and it's now owned by Vicky Piazza. It is a um charm, charming craftsman. It was built circa 1910. Uh it's one of the many houses as we know that are in North Dighton that were built by Joseph Milliken for the workers, it provided workers for management and workers in the neighborhood around the factory. Um, Mount Hope Finishing Company sold this property to Charles and Frieda Schwartz in uh, 1949. So it was quite a while that the company owned the homes. And I know Dan, you worked on some of the research on this house too, so thank you. Um, we're also doing a survey where more of the homes in North Dighton will be identified such as Vicki's has been. So next is a potential house marker candidate, right, Chris? <laughs> so she's going to come up and talk about her, her um, house. So this house is known as the Wright Turner Farm. Benjamin Wright and his wife, Mariam, built the house at circa 1775. It, it has a small L on the back, which was the original part of the house, still has its original windows. A lot of these homes started that way. There was a small room on the back and then the five over four colonial is built and in place in 1775. In 1766, it's just land. Now, um, it's a five over four colonial. I told you about the first room on the back. It has those same corner columns in every room, beadwork on each column. That was their way of fancying it up a little bit. Um, when we first bought it, we made some changes to it and then uh, satisfied with the changes. So my husband ended up taking the rooms that are older, taking out the old mop boards that were more Victorian and replacing it with beadwork that he hand planed to make it match everything else. Um, two additions are put on this house. On the left-hand side where you see it, you see the last one. You see the bump out. Just be, there's a little space before the bump out where an addition gets feet. And then that last out with five rooms on it, it's Victorian. We left it Victorian. Victorian mop boards, all the woodwork is Victorian. He actually stripped it all with dental tools and got it down to the original woodwork. What else do I want to say about this house? It is the basement. Is We did put some uh, jacks on it to bring the house up a little bit. It's coming up as far as it can. If you look at my bathroom door, it's flush here. And by the time it gets to the other side, it's an inch and a half <laughs> higher. That's as good as it's ever going to get because it can't be jacked anymore. 
but the basement actually has locust trees as supports for the house with their bark still on them. And I defy anybody to put a nail in them. They're there, they're holding the house up. You can't hammer a nail in them. Um, what I Funny part about this house is we bought it. We shoveled all the ceilings out the week before we moved in, almost killed each other in the process. And then it was my job to take plaster and chicken wire off the central chimney. And as I was stripping that off, I was thinking to myself, I wonder who the woman was that lived in this house. Because now we're starting to do historical colors. And I'm trying to figure out what color I want to put in the room. Halfway through, I decide I'm going to put this colonial green color in there because I've never used it before. Well, we're living in it while we're doing all this. So that room is number four to be done. And when he starts stripping all the old paint off, guess what the original color in that room was? That same color I was going to put on. So that lady gave me a little tip. So this was built and always was a two family until I bought it. The first tenant in this house, and this is what gives this house to me great prominence, is the Reverend Ezra Stiles. He's a minister in Newport. I saw his church a few years ago. He's run out of Newport by the British because he's sympathizing with the colonists. He comes to Dighton. He lives in the Whitmarsh house down the road from me for a short period of time. He's a widow seven children, and he has a black man named Newport that he buys and frees, and he brings him with him. He lives in the upstairs of the house. He moves in in November of 1776. He goes back and forth to Newport, preaching, always running out, and um, reads the Declaration of Independence in what is now the Dighton Community Church. And he develops a pen pal relationship with Benjamin Franklin. So they write to each other over the years about religion. Believe it or not, they're discussing whether there's an existence of God, and he's a reverend. They talk about Benjamin Franklin's experiments. They talk about the battles. He does a three-book diary during his lifetime. He draws out the battle in Newport. He draws out the soldiers marching down Elm Street. He then moves to New Hampshire, and he's a minister there for a little bit. Then he becomes the third president of Yale. University. They have his original three book diary, but they printed it one time at least. I found it in Newport next to where he used to preach. There was a bookstore there, so I bought it. We have the three volumes of his diary. And there's another book about him called The Gentle Puritan, mostly because he was against slavery. He bought, he didn't have a lot of money, but he was able to free one person. And, um, Really, on many levels, a man ahead of his time. So the we love the house. It will never be done. Old houses are never done. Sometimes I look at it and think, I'm never going to make it, and I'm not. But as for somebody else, and but the history in this house from the original owner and to this man is unbelievable. Now, the Turner part of this house is Charles Turner. He is a gentleman in town who's very active in town politics. He does a lot of things in the town. But he had the dubious honor of being the town's alcohol. So, and I forget which corner of my basement, but in that corner was stored the alcohol that belonged to the town of Dighton while he was a man in town that did a lot of work for the town. So it's got a lot of history. It's a lot of fun. You can pull your hair out sometimes but I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> I think those stories are amazing. Each house has so much to tell and, and we're very fortunate and we're fortunate that we have good caretaker owners, you know, that are taking care of the history and are caring enough to look into the people that lived in their homes. So what's next? Well, the commission continues to work on the surveys. We're doing a survey update and it has begun for the Mount Hope Finishing Company and Lincoln Ave in North Dighton. So we'll be seeing um, updated forms for that area. 
Once again, the CPC has provided funding for this project. The Historical Commission is reviewing the forms to prioritize um, what should be submitted to the Massachusetts Historical Commission for eligibility determination for the National Register. So there's a process. We take the forms, send them up to the Mass Historical Commission. They review them and they say, oh, we think this is eligible. Then send it or not and give you re the reasons why. And if it's eligible, then we get the lucky job to um, work to get uh, the application for the National Register Historic um, Districts or just the home. And um, again, they recommend that you hire a preservation consultant to do this because of the detailed work for documentation. Um, so that's an ongoing process it, that takes a while. Once the National Parks determines that it's a National Historic Worthy, um, we're golden, you know, but it's a process. And we're gonna have to have discussions about local historic districts in town. Um, many of us believe that that's the only way to really preserve the history of Dighton, just to have some control over what is happening to the outsides of these buildings, um, because otherwise we're going to lose them. Now, we're always looking for more information about these historic resources, because like I said earlier, this is just a highlight. It's a snapshot. There's so much more to the story to tell. And that's it. And thank you for coming. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them. I don't know if we can answer, but we'll try. We have the forms over there. There are also historical marker applications over there are some pens for everyone to take and a little brochure about um, the National Register districts versus local historic districts for your information. And that's that. So, uh, 50 years. And oh, the Historical Commission has been in existence for 50 years this year. Yay. <laughs>